Welcome to you all today. I'm Paul Pepis, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Joyce Weicho Chen, Assistant Professor of Historical Keyboards in the School of Music and Dance at the University of Oregon. As a solo harpsichordist, Professor Chen has performed throughout the United States, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Taiwan. She received the 2018 Individual Artist Fellowship from the Delaware Division of the Arts and was a featured soloist in the 2019 Emerging Artist Showcase by Early Music America. Her debut solo harpsichord album will be released later this year. Chen is also a PhD candidate in historical musicology at Princeton University and expects to defend her dissertation, Musica Experimentia Experimentum, Acoustics and Artisanal Knowledge in the Global 17th Century in December 2024. In addition, Professor Chen holds a Doctorate of Musical Arts in Harpsichord Performance from Stony Brook University and a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from UC Berkeley. She's been on faculty at St. Joseph's University, the University of Delaware, and Delaware State University. Professor Chen joined the UO faculty in fall of 2023. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Welcome, and welcome to the University of Oregon. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's uh, a total, total pleasure for me. So first of all, Joyce, tell us a little bit about your background, where you're from, and your trajectory to being what all the things you are today. Um, yeah, so I, um, I was born in Taipei, Taiwan, and I came to the States um, to pursue undergrad degree in engineering, as you heard, uh, at Berkeley, so uh, in California. So I spent some time on the West Coast, and because I was kind of a hippie back in college, I <laughs> decided to take a gap year to pursue my passion in early music, and I got a full ride to go to Stony Brook to study with my former teacher, Arthur Haas, and so that gap year be be became 12 years, 13 years. <laughs> and then so I just kept going one after the other. And I got the DMA because I you know, said, well, why not just keep studying? So it was kind of a byproduct of my journey in music and got a bunch of different jobs and eventually realized, you know, I, in addition to playing a lot, I also really like to be intellectually stimulated. So I pursue a second doctorate, um, a PhD at Princeton. And um, the past five years I was on the East Coast, actually the past 12, 13 years I've been on the East Coast, five years at Princeton, and I just got here a few months ago. So you just said, you know, you were getting this, this BA in mechanical engineering and you decided to continue to pursue your love of early music. So where'd that come from? What, what made you be interested in music performance and the harpsichord? Oh yeah, so I've been playing piano and violin since I was uh, just four or five years old and always play and then I find it helpful also for my, um, I was very good at in the sciences, so it kind of like worked with my brain somehow. And in college, um, I was a very, you know, focused student in engineering and but I was also a music minor student at the time and for music minor degree, um, um, the minor, you need to um, take an ensemble course. So at the time, orchestra seemed too demanding for me because it requires a lot of rehearsal time, a lot of concerts. So I said, well, I really like Baroque music, so I'm gonna try out uh, the Baroque ensemble. I didn't know Berkeley is actually one of the capital for early music um, in the whole world. So. I was just really lucky. I walk into this program that had so many different uh, period instruments, like historical instruments, that either modern copies were from you know 16th and 17th century, and so that just kind of like wowed me by surprise, and I really love it. And so I said, you know, I would love to do this. You know, it's not possible to study while having a full-time engineering job, as you know. So um, I just said before I go work for Boeing, that's one of the a lot of my friends work for Boeing, actually. Some of them are managers now. And I just said, before I go work for airplanes, I'm gonna uh, work on music. And so here I am. So yeah. you, you have pointed out that you, what you do is early music. So yes. how do you define that? What is that? Uh, so early music, when I was a student, was defined mostly about art music, Western art music from roughly late 16th century to mid 18th century. 
But since you know the last few years, uh, we have been having a lot of discussions about what means what does it mean to be early music? Is it mm. just a geographical location, or is it a particular style? So I would say early music now. Um, I, I would like to think about it more broadly as you know, roughly early modern period, and that might be that might mean something different in a different region. So we do see something like Mexican Baroque that is also early music because of colonialism. Mm -hmm. um, we do have you know a lot of we also have Chinese Baroque that that is not my specialty, which I do want to dig into later. But I have a lot of colleagues that kind of look at you know music from the missionary. Um, in China in 18th century. So that is also considered as early music nowadays. So along with early music is historically informed performance. What does that mean? How do you define that? So that is going, you know, kind of uh, together with early music is we know at this time um, we don't have the same kind of technology. We don't have the same kind of instruments. And so we have piano and violin today they have their predecessor from this time. So for instance, piano wasn't really you know, in use until mid 18th century. Harpsichord was actually the main keyboard instrument at this time. So harpsichord obviously has a very different mechanism. So we would use harpsichord instead of uh, piano. Um, so that would be part of a historically informed performance is using appropriate instruments, using the same um, a similar appropriate technique on those instruments. And so that's kind of the broader definition of historical performance. So have you faced any challenges while pursuing a career as a performer in early music? I mean, you know, I, w at the moment we don't hear, you know, I don't turn on the radio. We were just talking before you got here about Taylor Swift. That's what we think about when we think about music, you know, What's it like being an early music performer? I would say it's pretty challenging. I would say that's not my first advice to any undergrads. Like, <laughs> you should go and be a historical keyboard player. That should be your, you know, that was really kind of a, you need to really, 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 really love it and be kind of lucky and hardworking, all that together. Um, I would say I consider myself pretty lucky to just at the right time, the right moment, put out the right YouTube video so people know who I am. Um, but one thing I find it challenging, at least in my just uh, my example, um, you know, like kind of the mainstream classical Beethoven, Brahms, um, that kind of repertoire orchestra. You go in, you will know what you're expecting, right? So you go to a performance venue. It's very normal for them, for instance, to have a piano. So as a harpsichordist, I have to bring my own harpsichord every time and tune them. And most people don't think about that. Mm -hmm. So even when I'm buying a car, I need to bring a car to make sure it fits my harpsichord mm -hmm. before buying the car. That actually happened. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I had a Honda Civic hatchback. You won't believe it. It, hit, it fits a harpsichord. Not the big one. But when I was going to the dealership, they were trying to sell me. I was like, come to my house. <laughs> if it fits my, my, my harpsichord, I'll buy it today. <laughs> so that's one challenge. Uh, you know, Most people don't realize it's like, well, harpsichord, you have to do that. Um, violins, you have gut strings, which is m more prone to humidity, to breaking and everything, and the different kinds of period instrument, the amount of maintenance, just talking about instrument itself. And the next thing challenging would be, I would say just the whole networking, mm -hmm. because it's not as established like an orchestra. You can apply for an orchestra job. We have to be very um, kind of entrepreneurial and just create you know, a program because not every day someone's like, that's program a 17th century Italian Venetian pro program. N maybe some place like University of Oregon, but a lot of places they're thinking about something more generic. Then we have to come up with a program and proposal. So we also learn to be administrator, instrument mover, maker, um, you know, a concert, you know, kind of host. We have to you know, be very good program note writer. I write a lot of program notes and give a lot of lectures for that reason. So this is the challenging part, but you know, if this is a career for you, this is very fulfilling. <laughs> so 
you, you just mentioned all these different things that you have to do, but you've also engaged in opening the field of early music to diverse pr uh, practitioners. So say some, so tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I have been working um, as kind of one of the, <laughs> I would like to say activists in this field because as um, women of color, I, uh, as I said, part of the challenges, last question I didn't address so much is kind of uh, feeling as an outsider. You know, this is not, people will say, this is not your culture, this is not, you know, like Chinese Baroque didn't exist however many years ago. Um, but that's also kind of hard because I'm Taiwanese, so te not technically the same thing. So what I'm trying to do is to also promote um, people of color as practitioners. So I've been working at Early Music America. I'm currently the co-chair of the IDEA Task Force, which stands for Inclusion, Diversity, equity and access uh, task force. So uh, one of the projects we have worked on is bring early music to one of the HBCU in America, which I kind of led that project and just thinking about how can we translate this kind of teaching into a, a different institute because you can't just give the same course, just tr transplant to a different place. And one thing I learned in HBCU is not everyone has access to string instruments. So trying to create a string orchestra, Baroque string orchestra, just doesn't work. It hopefully will work in the future, but I was trying to look at what are some ways we can actually implement some of the early music elements in something that I already have in that system. So that's something I'm trying to do, and you know, hopefully we'll see some, some more projects like that in the future. So I... In my introduction, I explained you have this doctorate in musical performance, but you're also, as you pointed out, earning a second doctorate. Yes. Most of us here only have one, but you're, you're a unique individual in many ways. So you've got, you're, you're pursuing the second doctorate of, of musical arts in, um, in, in historical musicology. So why? why did, what, what, what decided, what convinced you that you needed another PhD? Oh, well, <laughs> Yeah, it's just, you know, once I finished my um, DMA, I gave seven recitals and one lecture recital and then many papers, and I just said that wasn't enough. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know. And I was like, I really like writing, I really like doing research. And as you know, my background in engineering, so part of my research was in kind of the science of sound, mm. acoustics, in a very like engineering way. Like I learned the hard sciences. I never got to use that in my, during my DMA time. But then, so I was exploring the different options. And so either a PhD in acoustics, PhD in physics. And I actually took some graduate courses in engineering and just said, you know, engineering, I can do it, but I may be only like 20% of the, the material. But music, I really love music. But then I can maybe put 20, 30% of science into the musicology. And so, Princeton has allowed me to do that. Like it's a very, um, you know, supportive program. So I, I can work with, I have my main advisor, but I also have several people I work with. And I'm currently doing some research at uh, Penn State University, which has one of the best acoustics program in the world. So tell us about the, the topic of the dissertation that you're writing. Uh, so it's called basically music musical experiment and experience. So this is kind of looking at in 17th century, we're thinking about how, you know, our sensory experience is really closely related to how people are thinking about developing experiments at this time, because this is also what we would call uh, scientific revolution is we came up with the method of come up with a hypothesis, having the same experiment set up, and then using your data to confirm your experiment. But usually one is informed by their own experience. Like you will observe, wow, I realize uh, when, you know, um, when the harpsichord is made this way, um, then the sound is X, Y, and Z. So, but if you did not have that experience, you wouldn't come up with the same kind of exper um, experiment or that kind of scientific knowledge. So that's my way of looking at how these two intersect together. Um, so I'm looking at mostly two big case studies. So one is by Maha Mersenne from 17th century, France, um, looking at, he wrote a whole book, um, actually two volumes, different musical instruments and acoustics. 
The other case is looking at slightly earlier, late 16th century, a Chinese theorist that does very similar things. So kind of looking at these two more global approach and kind of really reassess what does it mean experience experiment? Is it more, because that term in history of science is very much referring to the Western kind mm -hmm. of knowledge production. But we actually see similar things. And there have been, I will say, don't quote me on that, there have been several um, scholars that argue this Chinese theorist, his work have been transmitted to Mersenne. Mm. There have been, I'm not pushing, I, I don't know how I stand with that yet, but there have been a lot of arguments saying, suggesting. How are they explaining that? How would that have happened? So basically, so um, the Chinese there is Zhu, that's his name. He came up with the tuning formula um, for equal temperament. That was correct, like for the first correct uh, formula may have been transmitted to the West because when we see in the West from 1630s, half a century later, they almost didn't come up, come up with any calculation. They just like, oh, this is it. Mm. So there have been scholars saying, well, if it's not transmission, like how did they arrive at that point? So this is, a, I think it's less important to say whether there's transmission, mm. but it's more important to look at how they arrive at the same conclusion, like mm -hmm. without, you know, very much exchange. Hmm. How do they arrive at the same conclusion? That, that's actually still the formula we use today. Hmm actually from China, <laughs> so. So let's talk about experience. So as part of your project, you were an apprentice at Zuckerman Harpsichords, which is the last harpsichord manufacturer in the US. So what was that like? Um, it was really fun, actually. I, I love that. Uh, if anyone has the experience to go to Connecticut, uh, Mystic to Connecticut, please go and visit the shop. Um, it has a, it's actually, um, Zuckerman was the first company that came up with kits. So harpsichord kits that people hear about came from Zuckerman. It used to be in New York City, it moving to Connecticut in the 70s. Um, so I was there as an intern because I um, had to build my own instrument. So I go in there and, you know, I kind of begged the, 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 the CEO and said, you know, I really want to learn because I'm pretty sure I'm going to mess up this kit. <laughs> <laughs> going to like make a mess. So he allowed me to do work in exchange. So I made a bunch of videos for them as well. Um, I did a couple, you know, like just different projects. And I also learned just a ton as a regular apprentice. We all go through restoring different instruments and learning something I'm good at and not so good at. So that was a very <laughs> humbling experience because it doesn't matter. You have a hundred PhDs if you can't use if you can't drill a hole straight, you can't, <laughs> you know, like it's a very humble thing. I'm like, it's supposed to be straight. Why is it angled? And cause I wasn't using, I wasn't using my tool right. So you learn, I learn a lot. Just be like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm new to this and I'm learning from all these guys and they have no idea what is a PhD, you know, like they don't care and they just teach you. So you mentioned that you decided to build one of these kits and this, the, you, you built your own virginal harpsichord. So first of all, what is a virginal harpsichord? Um, so virginal is just a term that we're referring to mostly earlier harpsichord from late 16th and 17th century. And it's just the way it's plucking, um, the way the, the jack is plucking the string is at a different angle than what you usually see more like a triangular shape. Harpsichord, that would be just a normal harpsichord. So it's really talking about the mechanism. It sounds slightly more mellow, nasal sounding, uh, rather than you know, kind of a more sparkly sounding that you hear on normal harpsichord. How yeah. big is it in comparison to the normal one? It's pretty small. I can move it myself. It's pretty like I can move it. It weighs only forty nine pounds. And it's just it has no stand. Is that correct? It, it has a stand. It, you can buy the whole thing without a stand, but I did buy the legs that are screwed on. So they're really easy to transport and believe it or not i talk about transportation a lot because it's very important it fits into my little uh two uh two-door car like in the trunk so it's it's pretty manageable it's pretty small yeah. and uh, um how long did it take a long time so it the whole process so from start to finish 
was a year and four months, but I wasn't building continuously. I would say the total number of hours between three to 500 um, because you don't progress at the same rate. So I actually did my own painting as well, which took a long time because I would basically practice the same painting, um, the same motive, like a flower, 10 times be before I put it on the soundboard because you can't use a whiteout or anything to erase it after you paint it. So that took the longest. So the case was done in two months, but the rest of the painting took a while because I just didn't want to mess up the instrument. So say something about the painting. So when we think of a piano, it's just you know, yes. dark wood, we don't even think about decorations on it, but they ha they're highly decorated. Right? Yes, they're highly decorated. And at this time, a lot of time, you know, again, they're kind of, a, you know, show off your, your wealth and your status. The more elaborate, uh, the, the more, you know, you have money, like at this time. So we're just trying to, you know, kind of recreate some of that aesthetics. Um, and I kind of follow the same, you know, this would be seen as a Flemish, I mean, pseudo Flemish instrument. And so I was using some of the Flemish, actually the same copy. Um, so I was actually copying out the same mode that we find in, in another 17th century instrument, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 16, 1627, something like that. So I copy out exactly the same flower and put it there. So I was trying to do a like historically informed. <laughs> historically informed image. Are you yes. trying to do historically informed pigments as no. well? No. <laughs> I couldn't. Um, it was, yeah, I, I didn't go as far because it would be making your own paint. And I just, I wasn't at that level. I just, I bought gouache from the store. <laughs> but yes, I do know there's something like that. But maybe the next, well, I already have two soundboard paintings. I have two more instruments to finish. Oh, you're in the middle of building two more? Yeah. Well, restoring. And they're both harpsichords? Yes. <laughs> and those are for you or your? For me. For me. Yes, I, I brought uh, six instruments from the East Coast to West Coast. You have six harpsichords. Yes, so I already sold one. So, <laughs> so <laughs> is it, are you doing this to sell them? No. So six. why do you need six? I'm just curious. Are That's they are they are they do they sound different? I they mean, sound different. Uh -huh. They sound different, um, and it's just a hobby. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't need six, but it's a uh, it's. It's just like, do you need six cars? You don't, but you yeah. have six cars. You're a typical yeah. academic. We all have collections of stuff. Something. Yeah. yeah. Like mine is, you know, it can be worse. It's harpsichord. I can sell it when I re retire if I need to. So, yeah. Um, so um, I should say that if, if people go to your website, they can see a video of you mm -hmm. building uh, the harpsichord. Yes. It's a fascinating video to watch. Um, so. You are new to the University of Oregon. Obviously, you have a, a, a long and varied academic career. But here you are at the University of Oregon. What attracted you to the University of Oregon? Well, I, I was just really honored to have this opportunity here because it's been great knowing the whole institution. And it really attracted me because our uh, School of Music and Dance is such a, you know, it has like everything you need. Really, it's got a very strong performance program, really strong musicology, really strong ethnomusicology, uh, uh, composition and theory, which is, I can't really think about many other schools like this, where you, where especially for early music, you really need all these to support the area because as you know, like I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm, I know quite a bit about performance, but I also need to know a lot about history to kind of teach and to carry on this tradition like four generations. And also we have Oregon Bach Festival here, which is, you know, really a, a, a big force for, you know, Eugene, Oregon and from people from all over the world to come and see this. So it's been, you know, I knew about Oregon Bach Festival very, very early on and just now able to participate. I'm also really, really happy and honored. You said that you want to teach and pass this on. You say a little bit more about that. I mean, how do you understand your, you, you sound like you have a mission. <laughs> uh, maybe. Um, I, I think that has to do with early music is in a way, sometimes I'm afraid it's not the priority in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. I am afraid that might be the case in, in a lot of in academic institutions um, where early music was much bigger in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We can agree with that. Um, and I 
just see that there are some programs that have been just eliminated where they're just getting smaller and smaller. So actually having this here, it's just, you know, anyone like, anyone like me is a dream job. Like I'm able to do almost everything I want to do and to teach, you know, like on the West Coast, I think this is one of the two or three places you can actually come and study historical performance in a university setting. Um, and yeah, like I just have this passion, like I was an undergrad and learned all about early music and just fell in love. And I think there are people at U of O that feel the same way. I actually do know someone that graduated from the U of O um, in um, the HPP program and then later uh, went on, um, I met him at Princeton uh, as a, a different area uh, PhD, but like, I do see people from Yovo, like I come across people from Yovo and saying how much they enjoy the time here. So you mentioned the Bach Festival, which is everybody's very familiar with the Bach Festival, but this, the UO also hosts an annual Music King yes. conference. Uh, uh, do you have an interest in being involved there? I mean, oh, that yeah. is all about early music. And oh history. yeah, yeah, of course. So um, I, that was actually my first encounter with, with Yovo, which is now almost three years ago, unfortunately it was during COVID, the Music King, that was one of my first, um, second or third kind of international conference presentation. I actually presented here virtually. <laughs> so that was my fir uh, kind of first inter interaction. And then last year I also came here, gave a talk. And this year I'm also involved as um, giving a lecture recital and also involved with the, their um, Friday night uh, concert. Yeah. So, so um, you have an album forthcoming. Yes. Tell us about that. Um, so I recorded um, basically all variations and um, song settings from 16th and 17th century mu um, music. And I recorded that album on an Italian harpsichord and also a versional harpsichord, actually musical art. That's a different name uh, for <laughs> versional. And that was back in Princeton. So we're in, in the process of editing this and trying to, um, you know, get a recording deal and things like that. So hopefully later this year, if not like early next year, it should be coming out. And um, this is my last question. We're just about at the end of our time. Um, when will you be performing next? Uh, uh, well, next that will be actually, oh my God, let me think, two weeks from today actually in uh, Philadelphia. Um, I have um, three concerts there. Actually, sorry, six concerts, three concerts that weekend, and following weekend, three concerts, and come back to Eugene. I'm giving an organ recital. I'm giving also my solo harpsichord recital on campus. That's on actually April 16th. That's my first full recital here. But other than that, I'm traveling a l little bit, just performing at different places. That first, uh, you said two weeks from now. Say when that is, because people may not. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes, that's February. Sorry, six, 16 and 17, 18, that's in Philadelphia. I'm doing um, a program with Chamber Orchestra of Philadelphia. Yeah. Well, Joyce, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us. Welcome to the University of Oregon. It's really terrific that you're here. I hope that it's um, as rewarding for you as it will be for us. Great, it's thank you so much. You. Thank you. I've been speaking with Joyce Chen, Assistant Professor of Historical Keyboards in the School of Music and Dance at the University of Oregon. Thanks so much for watching.